present you some different computational model for the emergence of linguistic categories. And I will start telling you some motivation and theoretical challenges that attracted the mostly three physicists in physics department to work in, to work, uh, in a field that apparently is exotic for a physics department. I will start with a very short review of the naming game. Luke uh, already explained something this morning. And I will tell you something that is fundamental to understand the main focus of the talk, that is the category game. Of course, I will end up with some discussion and conclusions. So, well, statistical mechanics was born just two words, probably is trivial, but it's always so helpful to give some introduction. To study how global behaviors emerges, emerge out of local interaction. So the first goal was to derive microscopical losses of gas out of the knowledge of two particle interactions. Of course, there are 10 to the 23rd molecules in a mole of gases. The problem was not trivial, but was solved. Things went on incorporating uh, apparently more exotic and complex systems, like magnets till the 70s, but till now. Then suns, for instance. Again, we have grains that develop some global structures. Biological systems, like, for instance, uh, population of ants. And through the concept of emergence and self-organizations, also human dynamics. Here we are at uh, IMBS, and this is clear. A very known example is, for instance, uh, econophysics. That is the approach to the markets based on laws developed in statistical physics. At the same time, the study of language developed an appealing uh, framework for such an approach. That is, the view of language as an evolving set of conventions, socially, that is globally, accepted by a group. That, that is, language as a complex adaptive system. So, at the meeting point of these two tendencies, we started to work. In the, fold, in the field of so-called semiotic dynamics, Luke told you about this morning, that views language as an evolving and self-organizing system, and focus on culture, Let's say, I, I say this focus on culture because it is not the traditional evolutionary approach that is the other well-known approach. The motivations are obvious in this context. We have the web that now allows for global monitoring of human communication, so methods would be helpful to understand what's going on and also to design possibly new technological systems or experiments with robots like the one Luke told you about. In general, the problem is to understand how global behaviors emerge out of local interaction, as I was telling you. So our strategy here is trying to define simple models, as simple as it is possible, in order to allow for a quantitative analysis, and of increasing complexity to deal with problems of increasing complexity. That is the naming game, then the category game, and the goal would be grammar, but we are far from there with this approach. Quantitative analysis is the main focus, and also exploiting, whenever possible, analytical approaches. Of course, the dream would be to stay connected with the real-world systems and experiments. And indeed, the Tolkien Heads experiment is the conceptual reference to all, all the models I'm going to present later. So, even though Luke this morning gave the beautiful talk explaining his experiments, I will recall something about them. So we have population of robots that are quite complicated from the point of view of robotics. Vision, as Luke told us, for instance, is a very complicated and crucial task. They are not given any prior lexicon. A speaker and a hearer are extracted by the population at each time step. And they play, facing the same environment, language games of increasing complexity. In the easiest case, the naming game the speaker has to perceive a set of tasks that are quite complicated, again, from the robotic point of view. <coughs> then, for instance, once as, uh, chosen to speak about the red square, he transmits the word wabaku that, according to him, to it, indicates the word square. <laughs> yeah. The hearer has to perform the opposite set of uh, operations, and there are different possibilities. The ear could point at the red square, 
and in this case we had a success, or could ask for information, or could say, no, for me, it's the Webago corresponds to the blue circle, and according to the outcome of the game, they can rearrange their internal states to take into account what went on. So, in case of a success, reinforce the association between Wabaku and the red square. In case of, of failure, for instance, decrease the weight of the word Wabaku. So, we started with the simpler case, that is the naming game, and categories are not still present here. And for us, the theoretical challenges were, for instance, what are the minimal requirements for a shared vocabulary to emerge? For instance, the, ooh, there was, there were models, as Lucas showed us, to model the, the naming game, but the focus was at showing the possibility of operative models on the one end and at reproducing what, were, what was going on in the experiments on the other. So we try to simplify this. To understand, for instance, what are the global dynamics that lead to convergence, and for instance, to efficiency, that is the a, con a final condition in which there is no waste of memory. Then, which is the role of the system size? What happens if we put the agents on a complex topology or different topology in general? So these were the theoretical challenges, and we started by the, from the Tolkien Heights experiment with a population of n agents. Each agent is characterized in this case by its inventory or lexicon, that is a list of name object association. Agents don't cheat, they want to build a shared lexicon. And at this level, the easiest level, we discarded homonymy. So we can work with one single object, because of course all objects are independent at this level, and their parameter becomes trivial. And the key element is peer-to-peer -peer negotiation. Like in the experiment, at each time step, two agents are selected, and then we have to define which microscopic interaction rules they follow. Of course, depending on these interaction rules, the uh, dynamics will be different. And we ended up with these rules that are quite simple, quite simple according to us, and uh, that are these. At the beginning, all inventories are empty. So what happens is that the speaker simply invents a brand new name for the object, transmits it to the ear. Of course, the ear cannot know this new name in the system. We have a failure, and the ear simply takes into account the existence of this new name, storing it in its memory. So the inventory of the speaker grows by one. When the game goes on, of course, inventories will no more, will be no more empty, will be empty, well, okay, anymore. <laughs> so they are not empty. And the speaker simply performs a random choice of the names in its inventory. So we have no weights, transmits it to the ear, again, we can have a failure, but we can also have a success. A success happens when a reader knows the uttered word. In this case, we define this very strong rule according to which after the interaction, the local agreement is very strong and everybody, and both agents, delete all their words but the winning one. So they simply lose memory of the words. If you want, these are very, very strong weights, or otherwise we can say that there are no weights and there is a very strong deletion rule. So I will repeat these rules because in the category game models, this is the fundamental brick, and so it's a good thing to have it clear. So in this case, the speaker selects this word, the ear doesn't know it, it's a failure, and after the interaction, the ear stores it in its memory. In this other interaction, the, the name selected by the speaker is contained in the ear's inventory, and after the interaction, both agents have got the same unique word, and have deleted all their words. So the key elements are negotiation, memory, of course, this is not bounded, and the fact that dynamic, the, the inventories are dynamic. Well, the basic quantity is, like, as Luke mentioned this morning, to understand this, this game are the total number of words, that is, the sum of the inventory sizes of the agents, the number of different words invented by the agents, and the success rate, that is, the probability of observing a success at a given time. At the beginning, we have a trivial phase of invention, of course, that on average brings the number of different words to the value of n ounce, because they interact in pairs, 
and at this level we have no topology, so the homogeneous mixing population. Then we have the, and of course the, the success rate is almost zero and the number of, total number of worlds increases. Then we have a much more interesting phase in which there is a building of correlation going on. That is, agents exchange their words, and so somehow their inventories indeed becomes correlated. And you see the success rate now is low, but it's not zero anymore. This is a qualitative picture. Of course, we have performed much more detailed analysis. So the success rate is not zero anymore, and meaning that agents start to win. But winning means deleting words, so that the curve for the total number of words presents a peak, after which it becomes to decrease. Till, till a point in which we have convergence, that is, the simple, through, the simple rules we have uh, defined before lead the system to convergence. That is, a state in which the success rate is equal to 1, and everybody has got the same unique word in their inventory. So the communication system is efficient. See, yeah. That was exactly my question. The total number of words is the sum of the inventory sites. If we both have word A and B, the total number of words is four, and the number of different words is two, because A and B is co are content just one. So, of course, this is always larger than so in the end, everybody's got the same unique word. That is n words, because the total number of words is the sum over the number of agents, and one different word, because it's the same in all inventories. OK, so I, I don't want and we don't need now more details on this model. We have performed a detailed analysis uh, looking at convergence dynamics, scaling properties with the system size of the total memory, then time of convergence, the time at which the total memory is required, and so on and so forth. The role of topology that, of course, alters also the scaling property. The microscopic activity pattern, so in an heterogeneous topology, which is the behavior of different connected, differently connected agents. We have generalized the model to introduce a phase transition route between a state in which consensus is reached and a state in which uh, a polarization state uh, is asymptotically stable, the role of homonymy, and so on and so forth. But now we, are, we have to focus on the category game. That is, of course, the next step. So now the questions are more complex. The first one is, how does a population of agents establish and share an effective set of categories? The, same question that Kimberly and Natalia asked themselves before. Then, is a microscopic stationary state always reached starting from very simple, hopefully very simple microscopic and dynamical rules? And then quantitatively, which is the role of the parameters? That is the system size, the complexity of the environment the agents are facing, and the resolution power of the agents, so just noticeable dis difference if you want. And then we wanted to ask a big question. Can we deal with uh, a continuum perceptual space that is without presenting chips to the agents? Can we present a truly continuum space? Are they able to partition this continuum space into different categories? OK, this slide is completely useless here <laughs> because linguistic categories, of course, you know much better than me what, what do I mean with this word. In general, we have to notice that they must not to be not too large nor too small because they must allow to quickly point out something, but, and so it's a form of lossy compression, but of course they must also allow for a discrimination in the environment. So they have to take into account these different pulsions. In the category game, it's defined in this way. We have a population of n agents, again. An individual this time is, of course, more complex than before. It's a set of perceptual categories. So now I will skip some time to say perceptual, but when I say categories, I mean perceptual categories, and I will define them soon. Plus, I inventory is four categories. That is a list of nine category associations. 
The key ingredient is language mediated peer to peer negotiations. So agents will negotiate their categories, but through language. At each time step, again, two agents are selected, if we don't consider a topology, and presented a scene with different objects. That can be colors. Of course, I use color. All the caveats Kimberly said before about her model are, of course, valid for this model too. So real numbers in practice. A topic cho is chosen. The speaker must indicate it through a word. And the ear must guess which is the topic indicated by the speaker. Of course, discrimination is implicitly required. They must be able to discriminate this topic in the environment. And again, based on success failure, categories, words, and their associations are updated. So let's go into some more details. What's an individual? An individual is a simple low-dimensional channel. And in practice, we focus on one dimension, on the one-dimensional channel. So this is an individual. And these are real values in the interval. Of course, the U channel is a good reference to understand what's going on, but also a temperature sensor, an altimeter, and so on and so forth are good examples. Categories are subsets of this uh, interval. So each agent has got a partitioning of this interval, and these are what we call perceptual categories. There are many ways of defining, the, defining them. There is uh, with, uh, with the centroid or with the boundaries. At this level of modeling, doesn't make any difference, actually. We have synonymy, that is many words can refer to one category. And we have homonymy, that is one word can refer to many categories. And let's come to the rules. This is, unfortunately, I recognize a little boring, a little bit boring part, but it's needed to understand the dynamics that I hope will be much more interesting. So each agent has got a set of non-overlapping categories. This is a portion of an agent, and the categories are non-overlapping. They are defined by boundaries. They fully cover the interval. And at the beginning, they start being or having one category between zero and one. Each category comes with an inventory of words that is associated to each segment of this interval. There are words. I use wor color words, but OK, <laughs> we know. So red, yellow, green, green, for instance. At the beginning, when uh, agents create a new category, they associate to it a brand new word. OK. What's the this, this scene? The scene is made of m real numbers in 0, 1. At a minimal distance, d min. This d min is the just noticeable difference. Notice that this d min is a property of the scene presented, but not of, of the environment. So two objects in the same scene cannot be closer than d min. But of course, in different interactions, they can be as close as they want. So we are actually dealing with a continuum. One of the objects is the topic, and the speaker knows it and wants to communicate it later. So, Sorry, just yeah. So you're speaking of distance out in the real world, not distance on your, on your law line. Well, the fact is that. Distance in psychological space. Yeah, well, the fact is that the agent is the perceptual channel between 0 and 1, and the environment are numbers between 0 and 1. So in the same scene, it's basically the same. OK, so the speaker must discriminate the topic. Discriminate the topic means that he wants the topic be the only object in a, a perceptual categories of his. So this may require the creation of new boundaries. For instance, in this case, there are two objects from the scene that are inside the same perceptual category of the agent. And he wants to communicate about A. To discriminate A, he will have to create a new boundary here. And each new category inherits. So creating a new boundary means creating a new perceptual category. And each new perceptual category emerging from the partitioning of this one inherits all the words of the previous category plus a brand new one. OK, so olive and green is present in both of the new 
categories plus a brand new one that is brown and blue for this one. Is that Yeah, it's a bisection. It's just bisection. Do the names come from where? Uh, they are invented. They are numbers in the, in the simulation. So the speaker says the last winning word associated with the discriminating category. That means the, the last uh, word he had the success with using that category, category. Or the newly created one, if this is the first game played with that category. This is not crucial. Starting the naming game, we have seen that this is... Uh, more efficient strategy to select words uh, if compared to the random selection. Yeah. No, in the words there are infinite numbers. All the real numbers are up to numerical precision of the computer. In the single scene, in the single scene that is the part of the word that is presented to the couple of agents playing the game. There's one try. There is a random extraction of M objects, and they are presented to the. And when you say the speaker discriminates the topic, you mean the speaker chooses one of these M. Exactly. To, to be the, to it, it chooses, for instance, A, and w wants to communicate A to the ear. At this point, it requires A to be discriminated. That means A to be the only object from the scene to fall in a perceptual category. So in this case, he had two objects in the same perceptual category, and he wants to create, he needs to create a new category to discriminate that object perceptually. Okay. Well, actually, you simply add one, but, sorry? Suppose you have A, B, and C, and you want to communicate B, and they are all in the same region. Yeah, you put two, yeah. And you said the very question about the numbers for the, uh, uh, for the categories, or the stimulus, the stimulus, and that, are they to be interpreted as psychological numbers uh, in, quite, in, in a psychological space, or I think it's similar to a question vision space? Well, the, the fact is that in this model, the, 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 the agent the mirrors the, the perceptual space. But the differences are not the same. So physical, if, if I take a, a, a difference of two numbers, its physical meaning doesn't correspond to psychological meaning. Nor does bisection correspond. Bisection of physical stimuli does not mean bisection of, of, of psychological stimuli. So what are you using then when you think of bisection? Is it bisection of the physical domain or bisection of the Bisection, I would say, of the psychological domain. Yeah, because the environment doesn't vary after this bisection. I would say so. So there, at this point, looks at their inventory for the word that has been transmitted by the speaker and wants and selects a set of candidate categories that is, categories that contain the transmitted word and at least one object from the scene, of course. So there are different possibilities, and this is the last slide about the rules, so we are happy. If the set is empty, of course the game is a failure, and as in the naming game, what happens is that the error, the, the speaker points at the object, the error discriminates it in case it needs, and adds the speaker's word to the correct category, to the inventory of the category. If the set is not empty, the error chooses at random one of the candidate categories and makes her guess manifest. If the guess is correct, like in the naming game, both individuals reduce all their words corresponding to the involved category to simply the transmit the winning word. And of course, this word becomes the last winning word that will be played in the next interaction. Otherwise, the topic is unveiled, and the reader discriminates this scene, and the other word, yeah, is added again to the discriminating nearest category. Okay, let's come to an example to make sure everything is clear. This is the speaker, this is the ear, this is the scene made of two objects. A is the topic. The speaker has, needs to discriminate it, that it creates a new boundary. All 
both new categories in here, it's all the words plus a newly invented one. This is the one that is, will be transmitted for the rules we have mm, chosen to use. Of course, this is a failure, and after the interaction, this, the hearer will have added the word brown to the category, to its category corresponding to the word, to the object pointed by the speaker. Notice that, of course, categories, perceptual categories are different, and one agent has no idea of the repertoire of categories of the other one. There is no meaning transfer. There is only language, well, language. There are only these words transmitted. In the second case, the topic is A. The speaker doesn't need to discriminate it because it's already discriminated. Transmit the word green. There is a candidate category that is green plus an object from the scene. And both agents delete all their words, but they win in one, staying with green. Okay, let's come to the time evolution. You never delete the category? No. And we will see that... Okay, in case of a success, here we have A. There is no discrimination going on. The speaker will say green, for instance. The, the hearer hears green, checks in his repertoire of categories. There is one category containing green. This category contain, contains also an object from the scene. And say, well, you are talking about A. And it's true. So they delete all their words, but they win in one. Yeah, exactly. We will see the evolution curve for sign on me. So, so the time evolution is this one. Initially, of course, most games are unsuccessful. We, this is a quite small population, but yes, it's already reasonable. But then after around 1,000 games per agent, we observe a sharp transition bringing the system to high success. You see, quite high success, more than 95%, and increasing with re a reduction in the just noticeable difference. Okay, so two phases must be analyzed, before the jump and after the jump. And the jump, of course, approximately at 1,000 games per agent. Uh, yeah. So, at the beginning we have the naming game, basically. The naming game curve plus free categorization. That's why it was important to have a look at the naming game. Because for each category we have the typical naming game synonymy curve. The one we have seen before. This is the, num the inventory size, the average inventory size of each category. Okay? for different values of the mean. The number of categories grows trivially, like the square root of t. This corresponds to free discrimination. The probability of creating a new category is trivially this one, and so there is a and so there is this increase. But there is a saturation because, of course, if you think about it, it's very easy to realize that the number of categories cannot grow above 2 over the mean. Okay. So, of course, the the smaller the mean, the higher the plateau, but in the end, it will stop. Then we have the second phase, in which we have full communicative success. So, success is high. Synonym is eliminated. Okay? When, at our magic number 1,000, synonym is eliminated. So, most, if not all, categories have got just one word. Categories are still evolving because there are slow refinement, but basically the, the evolution of categories is uh, not, more, not anymore going on. And, but the problem is that categories are poorly aligned. So was, one could think, well, if these categories were well aligned, we would have a situation in which different agents face the same category with the same word, and then the success rate is high. So the problem is, that where does the high success rate come from? It's not so important. I will tell you now something about how to measure the alignment of this category, that you see is around 60-70%. To measure it is not 
trivial because in principle the number of categories can be different from agent to agent. So you cannot compare the first category of agent A to the first category of agent B because you could end up uh, with a mismatch. Luckily, as we will see, we do not need sophisticated measures, but however, we measure it in this way. This is player I and player J, and we create the overlap player IJ, whose categories are the combination of, are given by the combination of all boundaries of the two agents. Then we sum the square of the sides of the categories of each agent, that are at the denominator here, and multiply it by twice the sum of the square of this finer, category, finer partition. This is, in case the two agents were exactly the same, would be one. But otherwise, it's not trivially, we, we haven't studied it in details, in a sense that uh, being the number of categories not fixed is not trivial. However, with this overlap function, we observe that the alignment of perceptual categories is quite poor. Consider that it's even difficult to imagine a situation in which you have less than 0 0.5, but however, so it's, it's quite poor. So we have to look in much more detail into the uh, dynamic of the model. And we start by noting that when the success rate jumps, we observe a jump also in the curves for homonymy. So this is the number of categories associated to the same unique word. So a synonymy disappears. We have seen that it goes to one, that, is mean, that means doesn't exist. Homonymy is growing. And you see that the jump is very significant if it's from around one or exactly one before the jump to values that depend on the mean but can, go also, can grow also to order of magnitude. How this does this happen? This happens through the war contagion effect. That is, as the word says, <laughs> war contagion effect. That is, words manage to jump the frontier from one category to another. This happens due to the social interaction of the agents. Because let's imagine this trivial case. We have these two agents. This is the topic. This is the speaker. The speaker will transmit the word blue for the topic. The ear doesn't know the word blue, and after the interaction, it will, it will store the word blue in its category. Okay. Now, for simplicity, of course, this is not the case. Imagine that uh, these two agents happen to interact again with a topic that is very similar to the previous one. The speaker will transmit the word blue, but now the hearer has got the word blue in, a, in its inventory. So these times we observe a success, and both agents, after the interaction, we store only the word blue in the corresponding categories. This means that this word blue has managed to pass the frontier, and we now have a situation in which two contiguous or adjacent linguistic uh, perceptual categories have got the same name associated to them. And we call these linguistic categories. And indeed, we observe the emergence of linguistic categories. And this is a, a true emergence in the sense that, of course, from the point of view of the code, linguistic categories do not exist at all. But they are just a result of the social interactions of, of the agents. And linguistic categories comes with some interesting attributes. They, first of all, well, we observe that they emerge as connected sets. In principle, they would be also not connected, but they emerge. Then, the number is much lower of that of perceptual categories. This is the figure. This is the trivial curve of perceptual categories, always increasing. And this is the curve of linguistic categories. You see, there is a peak, and then there is a stabilization. So, first of all, it's much lower, around between 10 and 20. And secondly, there is like a, a freezing dynamics. So, in the model, of course, there is only one absorbing state, that is the one in which there is only one word for all the perceptual categories of the agent. But the freezing dynamics would require to the system a huge amount of time to get there. In physics, there is 
we, we imagine that we can perform an, anal an analogy with spin glasses. Don't know if you are familiar with it, but are systems that get trapped in metastable state. But it is good for us because the system is taken away from a trivial state, living in a very interesting state for us. And the alignment on the of the linguistic categories is much higher, and that's why we have the success, because we uh, play through language. You see, this was the overlap functional, the alignment of the perceptual categories, and here we have this jump of the alignment at the linguistic level. So we have this emergence of a linguistic layer on top of a perceptual layer on which we observe this success. And which is the role of parameters? Well, the number of linguistic categories that at this point are the interesting ingredient, no, ingredient, no, they are not an ingredient, the interesting feature of the model, slightly increases with n, and by saying slightly, I mean that if I increase of two orders of magnitude the, the population size, they increase of less than two. So it's logarithmic or less. But most importantly, this is probably the most important result, they saturate for small d mean. So what's this plot? This is the number of linguistic categories. This is d mean. And these are snapshot of the system at different times, up to 10 million gain per agent. And what happens, you see, is that at the beginning we have a strong reduction of this, of this curve, but then the dynamics slows down, and slows down both in the direction of time and in the direction of d-mean. Of course, we don't have any analytical proof nor computational proof that this is true in the limit of d-mean going to zero. That is, that would be nice. But however, this strongly indicates that there is this saturation. So, what is the projection that the goes to zero? It goes to zero? No, it should be, this would suggest, yeah, 20 now it's a number. Yeah. Yeah, so if this could be a plateau. Of course, we cannot say actually what happened. It doesn't matter what. You always get 20 colors. Yeah, 20 now, it's, uh, it's, this is uh, a simulation with 20, yeah. But however, around between yeah, 10 and 20, I would say. What, what is that point up there about near 80? This is at the beginning, after only 1,000 in... Because this is time. This is our gains per player. Each curve is a different time. So we have, in this direction, time. And you see that at large time, we have that freezing we were commenting before. Then, in this direction, we have a varying of d-mean. Yeah. But now I have a question. Yeah. The number of objects that are present that you wouldn't see. OK, the number. It, it's probably not so crucial. It has the effect of reducing, reducing slowly the success rate in this sense that when you want to discriminate the topic, you only want to discriminate, to discriminate it by, from the closer object. So adding a large number of objects has the net effect of reducing this effective distance but n not per well depends of course indeed of course we use compositionality when we have 2000 red objects uh, i wouldn't use a color to point an object to you for instance i would say that the larger one the one on the table i imagine however we, all all these results are with two objects I'll, up to 10 objects uh, things basically don't change and then we haven't investigated in it into details. So, so I guess the, the right way to think about it is it's, it has to do with the distribution of distances between the object you are supposed to name and the Exactly. To. Exactly. Pushes closer the other objects. But now there are some results that will add something on this. Okay, so the role of, <coughs> of the parameter is clear and the mechanism 
is this emergence of a linguistic layer. Okay, so what about the environment? What's the environment in this model? The environment is the probability distribution according to which we select this stimuli. So this is this plot. Each segment is an agent. Fine ticks are perceptual categories. Larger ticks are the boundaries of linguistic categories. And the numbers are the names of these linguistic categories. So you see we have different boundaries <laughs> in the sense that, for instance, this one is not so more aligned, so probably something will, going on, will go on here. This seems more aligned. We have to look in details at the properties of the boundaries. We, yeah, we will do it in future. The property of the boundaries of linguistic categories. But however, now staying at the role of environment, what happens is that when the stimuli are randomly selected, in practice, we observe an homogeneous distribution of categories. In this particular run, this is not true. This is much smaller than this. But if we repeat the run, of course, we observe that things will go differently. OK, what happens with a different distribution, not random anymore? For instance, I take the U channel of this picture, and I give it to the agents. So this is the histogram of the, um, of the distribution of the stimuli. And it seems from this picture that the agents react by, by, by finer partitions of more st most stimulated regions. So here we have a finer partition. Here stimulus, stimuli are low, are few, and the categories are larger. This view is confirmed by the, this third picture where we have an igloo. Apparently this picture has got a lot of blue here. And indeed the population reacts by a very fine partition of the blue region and the large categories in poorly stimulated regions. OK, so up to now with the environment. Then there is some room for genetic biases where there could be, because the mean is the only parameter of the model. Is there just noticeable difference? Can I ask you about your previous slide? Of course. So um, you said that the environment is the only parameter of the model. Is biased. Uh -huh. um, so, um, would you find, so to, to consider the idea of, of heterogeneity of, of individuals, and the idea that, that, for example, someone who has a reduced color space, who's in the same environment as another person with, with a less reduced space, is sampling, in a sense, ah, yeah. a different rate. Would, yeah. would that be predicted from this, from, from your results here as well? Mm -hmm. Well, no, we, we should perform these analyses. And indeed, it's what I, <laughs> I wrote here, <laughs> that the disease, the genetic biases of the agents, in our case, the mean, is it just no this difference, can in principle vary on the 0, 1 axis, so on different regions, and I will show you some results about this, or also from individual to individual, and I pointed to your work. <laughs> So, and this is a work, uh, it's, very, very, it's very in progress as we are performing it with Tao Gong in Roma. So, we focus on the first case in which the just noticeable difference varies on the uh, perceptual space. So, for instance, we can have a region in which uh, the value is alpha, a second region beta, then gamma, and then again alpha, for instance. And we start with a very easy situation in which we have three regions with a large d-mean, smaller d-mean, and a very small d-mean. Here I plot, uh, well, this is the plot I showed you before. And of course, there are finer partitions in the regions in which the resolution power is higher. And these are the percentage or the fraction of agents using the same word. And you see, of course, categories get finer where the resolution power is higher. We can perform some more detailed analysis, for instance, with a continuous the mean that varies continuously. And for instance, in this simulation, this resulted in a huge category at the center of the perceptual space and finer categories at the frontiers because the just noticeable difference is smaller there. 
and of course we can play with things but <laughs> just playing this is the supposed uh, just noticeable difference response to u channel in humans we can reproject this curve into our perceptual space we are also lucky because as you see the values here are the one we used to work with between 0, 0, 001 and 0, 0, 004 and we can obtain something like this in a single simulation that agents of course react again partitioning in a finer way the most the regions in which uh, the just noticeable difference is smaller here I just put the centroid. This is evocative, but of course, uh, okay, we know that we are only dealing with numerical simulation. Now I want to. Is that detailed uh, result published, or is that the first time you presented? Yeah. Ah uh, no, this is the first time. We are. This is a very, very new result. I just presented. Uh, yeah. And so before concluding, I want to draw your attention on a point as uh, I was telling before that we, we have compositionality and of course if a category is not sufficient to discriminate we can add further specification and we totally ignore this in our model the agents have got just one uh, channel and they have to work on it so if we put 2,000 objects, we decrease the effective distance here, and of course the success rate decreases as well. So, it would be nice in a future model to add also the possibility of compositionality, and probably we can have, we have a path, because we, can, we could go on in the same spirit, because I want to draw your attention that the category game agent is actually made of naming game agents. That is, each perceptual category is exactly a naming game agent. And the category game agent has got the prerogative of deciding which is the naming game, game agent that has got to play, and eventually can create new naming game agents. So if we were interested in extending the model and create a next agent, this could be made of category game agents, channels, we could add dimensions to the space, and these new agents should decide which channel or combination of channel has to, to play and in case, well, we, we should think about that could also have the ability of creating new dimensions in this space okay, so in conclusion, the category game is quite simple can incorporate empirical results and so could produce some checkable prediction in the sense of obtaining features that are known to be present in real systems but this doesn't mean to reproduce the work color survey data of course we have performed a quantitative approach and new discoveries well, quotation we have dealt with a continuum perceptual space and this is true this time we have uh, investigated the role of the just noticeable difference of the population size, of the environment, of perceptual biases and we, can, we won't go on with the heterogeneous population for instance like uh, Natalia and Kimberly are doing so well and then the systematic appearance so the, the, the key feature of the model is the systematic appearance of homonymy triggers this new linguistic layer that is not present, so it emerges actually, and on this linguistic layer we have success. Yeah, because agents need to, uh, to communicate. And linguistic categories are much more aligned in the population. So the success rate, and so this is what I was telling before, decreases a little with the number of objects in a scene, but we have compositionality and the number of linguistic categories is kept low by the necessity of alignment that is, they cannot stay with the same with a high number of uh, linguistic categories because otherwise understanding each other would be impossible and in this model a single agent would end up with a number of linguistic categories that is equal to the number of perceptual categories so it would we wouldn't be able to create linguistic categories. 
because without communication it would stay stuck. Well, this is just to mention, but it's not worth mentioning. And so here you can find some references and it's all. Thank you. Okay, so well, that's and they run. The rules were clearly aspired to the, the documents as peers. Well, assuming space is about the internal representation of the person and it's bisected. Yeah. So that sort of stuff is that they have a scale and size and they can operate on these scales by bisecting them. Well, it makes. That's a very powerful Yeah, I would say that. Now, if that humans don't do that, yeah, you can add, the important point is that since everything that is interesting and the success happens to this linguistic layer, the microscopic rules of the creation of perceptual categories are not so important. You can add the noise, for instance, moving instead of by setting. I don't know. If you add noise and you cut randomly uh, in between things, well, if the noise is not uh, terrible, things are quite robust, I would say. Still, it's still, still, but still then you're working on the external scale and you're getting the noise. If you have noise on the internal scale, you have the same problem. That you randomly pick on the internal scale because you have the existence of the internal scale. Well. Well, if you bisect, you ask them to bisect, they'll carry out the, the operation. Like just a, a spatial one. Right, for example. Yeah, the spatial ones they do well, but they do other sorts of things. And the problem is, is that bisection means getting exactly the half mm -hmm. of the operation, and so it has value for its property. That if you bisect bisection, you have an equation for the bisection that not to be satisfied. It's not bisymmetry. So it's what's called bisymmetry. But so, like on what sort of a task? On color. On color. Yeah. Okay. And what do they do? Well, they frequently have stated on color. Right? Okay. What um, do they do? Particularly the thing that you're talking about. Yeah, it's the bisymmetry that they don't satisfy. Ah, okay. So what happens if you just drafted these two other questions? Oh, it's the same thing. What do you do by random? How do you randomly choose them? You do it into the orbital scale? How do you randomly choose something on the orbital scale? I mean, how is how, how are what is the mechanism the person uses for running these scales? Choosing them. Because you can have you building in a random number generator as a person. Yeah, or, yeah. You know. and, and then, not only that, random number generator, but having a number generator on an internal scale. Like, yeah, no, I, I, of course, this is an object on, concerning humans, and I yeah. cannot it's say exactly. anything. So, <laughs> so robots can do this, and yeah. yeah well, but you're, it's not that robots are doing. No, you who? The robots, I think, as an entity, uh, don't have the ability to do that. He's assuming they do. That. No, but no, do. the robots don't have the to, to ability to do this with colors. Yeah. Take it as random numbers. A and robot they, was presented numbers. Right, but then you're assuming this random number representation you have, this internal representation, uh, would be very hard to evolve. We the random process is not, but you're assuming it's on their internal scale. All, all he has to say is that his robots aren't modeled for the uh, Well, they, but robots. there is sort of like a, a sense of a very high degree of precision, you know, yeah. assigning these points yeah. down to that line. But that and I just wonder whether, you know, you could, presumably this would be robust against that, and the linguistic categories would be much broader than the underlying information anyway. Mm -hmm. 
whatever that underlying discrimination is, why that's even really relevant. Um, but you could you could explore such possibilities as um, you know the, the the person has a choice fuzzies or set of perceptual distinctions. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, but this this cuts out simulations from the world. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. You have a scale built built in the model, and yeah. Well, it's not my field. It's defined. The temperature tells you this is this being the landscape. The temperature tells you where you are, and then the structure of the interaction between the spins tells you this. The, the, the shape of this landscape. Uh, this depends on, on, the, on the system, of course. In the number of... In the... This, well, this, I don't know actually exactly. No, the temperature tells you where you are in the phase space landscape. The shape of the, space the phase space landscape is given by the structure of the Hamiltonian, that is by the, if this is the Hamiltonian, well, <laughs> if this is the Hamiltonian, this gives you the structure of the, the quencher disorder gives you the structure. No, 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 I don't have a precise analogy. I, you have to give me, I only ask you this question, where does the number 20 come from? Eh, no, yeah, yeah, <laughs> the number 20, yeah. 
first of all, we are investigating it. Second, uh, so we are investigating it right now. As I told you last time, this was the problem. Then the paper got lost in some editorial processing, and so we work it a little. Yeah, this question is still open, but the problem is that uh, the analogy is in this sense. The number 20 is not fixed. It's between 10 and 20, I would say. And uh, we have different phases. We have a growth of the number of linguistic categories that follows the growth. Of, at the beginning, they are exactly like the perceptual categories. Then we have a reduction. And then we have, at a certain point, between 10 and 20, that the system gets stuck here. And then if we observe very small systems, for very long times, we observe that after a while, there is a drop of one category, and things will go on like this. Now, the, the problem is that uh, to understand the length of this plateau with the parameters of the problem, in particular with the size of the, of the population, and the problem is that it's so slow that we are not able to, to observe things. Consider that in the spin glasses, it goes like an exponential of the number of the agents. Now, I don't think we have, we don't have quenched disorder, so I don't think we will find an exponential so as strong as in the spin glass. But however, for sure, at least n to the sum power, this power being larger than three, I would say, the, yeah. And uh, no, the size between 10 and 20, this is given by the evolution of the particular simulation, I would say, because there is some quenched disorder that, is, that are the partition. And so I would say that this is quite. Because we were lucky, I would say. No. So, I mean, is it dependent on parameter values? Or yeah, yeah, no, we, we talked about this. <laughs> no, it depends on nothing, apparently. No, yeah. No, 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 it's not like pi or e. If you always chose five stimuli that were within a very small region of each other, and those were always the stimuli in a given C, rather than choosing them at random from the entire space, uh -huh. right, you, you force uh, a much finer grain of quantity. Uh -huh. Yeah, no, of course it depends. Because your, 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 your things tend to be reasonably well spaced out, that you can get away with roughness. That, that's that's uh, a thing that is I mean, like sure for... And of course, it depends right. logarithmically, sorry, on the mean. What? So we, mean, we are exploring a particular, a, a very small region of the mean, if you think in logarithmic scale. Because we are working between 10 to the minus 1 and 10 to the minus 3. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's sorry. We have well, we are working not on a circle on a segment. So. so uh, yeah. So uh, yeah, no. Uh, yeah, no, that's interesting. It, it, I was thinking about it uh, earlier while you were talking. Yeah, I, I think so because of this uh, this result. Yeah, yeah, this basically. Yeah, we could have a very fine partitioning like you you find with K-mean. Yeah. Yeah, no, that, that's an extension of the model introducing a parameter. And what is that corresponding? Uh, if you want, I can show you. I have another presentation <laughs> slide. OK. And however, it's a parameter ruling the probability of deleting of our, all our words after a success. Instead of doing it with probability 1, we do that with probability beta. And you find a very clear first transition, more than one first transition, because you have a value of beta under which you will have two words 
living forever, then a value under which you will have 3, 4, 5, and till beta equal to 0 is trivial, of course. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you.